know, good morning. It's just another Monday. I'm going to do a little top end engine health testing discussion here. Hopefully we won't be here that long and I hope you guys get something out of this. But I will jump into this thing and we'll see what we can do. Everybody's done compression testing if you've done much engine work. Uh, you know, we used to <clears throat> the right way to do it. <clears throat> of course, we don't usually, <laughs> whenever we're working on one, if we got a misfiring cylinder we want to check compression on, we just go ahead and pop that one plug out and check it. Well, the right way to do it is to uh, pull all the plugs out, disable the fuel system, hold the gas pedal all the way to the floor every time you do a compression test, spin it over until you get six puffs on the needle. Um, and of course, you need a the compression test little check valve there in the bottom of the compression test little Schrader valve it needs to be able to hold pressure too because uh, if it doesn't you're just going to see a bouncing needle you know then you won't really get an accurate compressor reading anyway <clears throat> everybody's done this to cement a diagnosis you know to figure out what the deal is put a little get low compression put oil in there the compression comes up points to rings this is a relative compression test so I might as a real stickler will take a couple of pulse sensors and they'll measure intake pulse and exhaust pulse and do a relative compression test using measuring the current that the starter pulls. You know, the, the starter makes this big, uh, this big spike to begin with and it basically and then it comes on down and if if one is actually pulling less current than the rest of them when it comes up and you can count the you know pulses. This, what he did here, cup coil, see? Number one cup coil pulse. So this is cylinder number one right okay so if it's pulling less current on one of these you know that you got a misfire well you can listen to it too when you're spinning it over it'll go whoa, 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 whoa. you know you know you got low compression on one cylinder you just got to isolate which one it is but the tool the uh, that Autel tool I got um, that for checking charging systems it's got a relative compression test function I probably should demonstrate for one of these videos pretty doggone handy now this one here was with I did with Ace Misfire Detective software, which cost about twelve hundred dollars. I don't even think you can buy it anymore, except maybe you might be able to get it from AES Wave. I don't know, but um, this thing right here, you put a pulse sensor in the exhaust, you hook the uh, uh, amps and volts up. You know, hook battery voltage, amperage. You know, amperage and voltage go in opposite directions. You can see what you're seeing right here. And it would actually tell you which cylinders didn't have any compression, which, you know, using this little bar graph thing, which is pretty cool. Um, I will say that Ace Misfire Detective, you know, you're supposed to be able to connect it with the pulse sensor and the exhaust and number one cylinder. You have to have that hooked up on this too, so it'll know which cylinder is which. <clears throat> and you got to tell how many cylinders it's got, what engine it is, and all that kind of stuff, so it'll know the firing order, blah, 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 and all that. Uh, but... I would have one that was misfiring, and I'd say, well, let's just use Ace Misfire Detective, you know, because I'd show the students this. Use a Pico Scope, and I'd uh, tell it the test for the misfire, and it would flag the misfire on different cylinders, first one and then the other. So you'd have to run it several times and see which one it agreed with itself on. <laughs> anyway, I, I, was, I was really kind of disappointed in uh, the fact that it didn't, it wasn't as reliable on that but it did other stuff really well um, anyway now a dynamic compression test is look at this gauge bouncing like it's doing you need a better gauge than that if you're doing a dynamic compression test you're checking it with the engine running it's a really significant diagnostic tool but it's seldom used so you can use it to pinpoint the cause of misfire when all the usual tests don't reveal a problem you're go having to go deeper because it's something that you checked everything and you're trying to figure out what in the world is it going on here you know well static compression and cylinder leak down testing checks how well each cylinder is sealed against compression loss and you can connect a vacuum gauge to measure manifold vacuum and determine an engine's capacity to breathe and you if he's got a bouncing if the needle's bouncing you know it ought to be read right in here at idle if the needle's bump 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 and it's bouncing along with your uh, misfire you know you got a cylinder that's you know got a valve issue or a cylinder with, you know, whatever, leaking, leaking valve, low compression, something like that, for some other reason. Uh, but it, it doesn't typically pinpoint which cylinder has the problem unless you're actually testing that one cylinder. <clears throat> the cylinder leak down test is pretty handy. You might remember the um, Honda that I said we were checking that uh, it was uh, 
it sounded normal spinning over and I told the uh, students I said we're going to go ahead and do a uh, cylinder leakage test on this because cylinder number four had no compression whatsoever now this uh, engine wouldn't run but it, we, it spin over normally it didn't have any compression at all on cylinder number four. I did a cylinder leak down test on it. It had no cylinder leakage because <laughs> the rod had busted off from the crankshaft and the piston was at the bottom of the hole, wasn't moving, but it had no cylinder leakage whenever you brought it around to where that cylinder should have been at top dead center, you know. thought that was pretty interesting too. So volumetric efficiency, you can actually get software that will do volumetric efficiency tests for you you know when you're connected to your data link and all that the uh, radio that I had in my Explorer until yesterday had a volumetric efficiency uh, PID where it would check volumetric efficiency while you were driving and uh, little by little all of that stuff died on that radio and so I replaced it with a different radio yesterday that I got from Amazon because I got tired of it you know it lost its GPS ability it lost its ability to communicate with my uh, OBD2 uh, EL, ELM327 or dongle, you know, that head there. But this right here is basically a, a waveform, you know, zero, you know, top dead center compression. It fires, piston goes down, comes back up, you know, it's, it's gone 180 degrees by now. All right, so this is exhaust stroke, pushing the exhaust gas out. Uh, this is basically atmospheric pressure down here so this pushes the uh, exhaust out and then that valve closes and this drops because you're actually pulling air in right and then it comes back up and squeezes it and it fires again so there you go that's your 720 degree cycle right there but your PO304 because it's got this uh, crank learn adapt you know uh, the uh, what they call uh, Chrysler called it uh, had a different name than crank learn on it, adaptive numerator or something like that. And what it would do is when you're when you're coasting, it gets a picture of what the waveform on the crank sensor looks like. And then whenever you're, uh, you know, and it stores that and it compares that to what it sees when you're driving. And whenever it sees a misfire because of the way those little pulses on that crank sensor are spaced, it knows when it's misfiring. It uses the cam sensor for that too, by the way. Uh, but if it can't perform the functions properly at a loss of volumetric efficiency or a density misfire means the air is not thick enough. Now this chart for a four, four cylinder obviously you need a, you know, a row for each. Uh, you're still only going to have these three columns typically but you're going to have a row for each cylinder. All right, So you start with a static compression test and put those numbers in the column under static. Um, okay, duh, you know it's not too hard to figure out. The next step would be put all the plugs back in except the cylinder you're checking. <clears throat> Short the spark to ground and disable the fuel injector. All right. So you're idling here. You're going to, you know, let's say you're going to see something. It's going to be a little less because of volumetric efficiency. And so you take the idle readings, hold it at about 1200 RPM. That's not really an idle, it's just above idle. But do it anyway. Put those numbers in the idle column and, you know, hold on to that chart. Next step is you snap the throttle to 2500 RPM and release. You may have to do this a few times, you know, before you'll be satisfied with what you got. These numbers should be at least 80% of the static reading. All right. So you see the problem here, what we, you know, our fictitious car has got 85 PSI during the snap. But you notice, you didn't notice the difference here, you didn't notice the difference here, but you did notice the difference here. That's a significant issue. So if the snap reading is below 80% of cranking compression, it's not able to get the air it needs, right? Worn intake lobe, intake valve carbon deposits, weak valve springs, worn valve guides, rocker or push rod problems, intake manifold valve run. Any reason that, uh, anything that keeps that valve from opening as much as it should or keeps it from opening at all, or, you know, is going to cause that issue. All right, so a snap measurement that's over 80% of cranking compression, on one cylinder means the air is being trapped and you got exhaust valve issues bent exhaust valve push rod worn exhaust cam lobe I didn't actually create a good uh, you know like this would be higher if than, than that it would be like uh, you know higher than 85 this is not an accurate thing I should have done a better job of that chart but you know what I'm saying um, so if it's uh, remember now if it's 
over 80% of crank and compression. So 80% of that, do the math. Uh, you're going to have, like, if you had, like, a, you know, 100%. Like, if it was more than these others. See what I'm saying? Let's say this was, like, a 190, or, I mean, a 140 PSI, or, you know, even close up to 150. Uh, then you'll be looking at that uh, an exhaust valve issue. It can't get rid of the air is what it basically amounts to. Now, low reading and idle and snap is uh, bent or burnt valves, valve seat, carbon buildup, worn valve guide, weak springs, cord cylinder wall, leaking head gasket. You can, look at, you can freeze this slide and look at it. I'm not going to keep reading all that stuff to you. But you see, if you see numbers like that, you know, you got uh, definitely got issues there. But see, notice how you can get normal looking readings here, but get readings here that are different. See how you're going to smoke out a problem that way? Now, I mentioned this uh, of, yeah, last week or week before, I don't remember, at that truck shop, you know, do a ticket, International Lodestar. You can see how the cylinders are numbered here. And uh, these oddball engines here, incidentally, when you set the timing, you were supposed to put the, uh, the hook the timing light uh, inductive pickup to cylinder number eight, which I always thought was weird. But anyway, <laughs> and that's on these old international engines like this. I rebuilt two of these engines when I was on wheat harvest in Montana. Uh, but working in this truck shop, misfire on cylinder number two. All right, so I did a wet and dry test. I did a dry test with no compression at all. Squirted oil in there to see where the, you know, why I didn't have, and I got 180 PSI. So I told the boss what I found. I told you this last time. You know, he secured permission to rebuild the engine. Got the valve cover off. I found the problem. Um, the intake, number two intake push rod was lying in the valley and the rocker arm was just bouncing around. So the intake valve was not opening at all until I squirted oil in there. Okay, and so you know, piston with good ring seal, which it increases the quality of the ring seal whenever you put oil in there, right? So that caused it to have enough of a good seal here to where when that piston went down, atmospheric pressure would pull that valve open, would push that valve open, because this is happening really fast. And it would get enough air in there so that you could, when it had enough air in there so that when the valve slapped shut, when the piston started coming back up, the compression came right up. Because it was pulling about, you know, you, this is not going to work every time because you're not going to have, you know, good solid seal with oil in there around the rings and all that kind of stuff. But you got low pressure here, you got high pressure here, you got slightly higher pressure in a crankcase than you do in here. Not quite here, but it'll be a little less than that, you know, PCV's going to pull in some air through there. But uh, it's basically going to do that. Now, here's something else that can happen. Now, you might remember me talking about this Honda car uh, when Richard Sheffield came over and he had his snap-on counselor and he hooked the vacuum. We were doing a vacuum waveform and uh, the engine would smoke a little bit. And uh, He looked at the vacuum waveform. He looked at the engine smoking a little bit. And he goes, hey, this, this, this engine is one tooth off on the cam timing uh, because we checked the compression and it was high too, higher than it should have been. And... Uh, he says, um, so whenever he, he's, he was teaching a class, a compression class that night, he went on the next day, I had the students pull this thing down. Sure enough, it was one tooth off, just like he said. It was basically closing the valve early, the intake valve early, and it was pulling all around the rings into the cylinder, and that was doing a perpetual wet test, basically is what it was doing. You notice it was smoking too, is what he was talking about. Now, this was a high mileage car. It's not going to be the same all the way around, like on a brand new one and all that, but that was a high mileage engine on that. It was an old Honda Accord. What's wrong with this picture? My buddy Donnie sent me this. <laughs> this was on a, a Chevy 4.3, um, and uh, that, those uh, rocker arms, uh, the push rod punched right through the rocker arm. I don't know if it's because the guy floated a valve and the piston hit the valve and rocker arm was, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on here, but it's typically usually means somebody was just driving this dog wax out of it, you know. All right, let me ask you a little trivia here. Which cylinder is number one on this engine? Look very carefully at this picture and tell me which cylinder is number one. Now, there's two or three different ways you can tell. And I'll cover that when I get to the next slide. But think about this for a minute. I'm going to wait for just a minute and let you think about which one of these cylinders is number one and why you can tell it's number one. Bing, bing.
Ding, ding. You need a lifeline? <laughs> All right, look at it. I'm going to let you think about it for just a minute. I'll try to hush long enough for you to think about it. There's, there's two or three different ways you can tell. <coughs> All right, that's number one. Now there's a couple of different ways you can tell. First, it's a Corvette, which means the cylinders are going to be numbered one, three, five, seven, two, four, six, eight. Right? On the other side, is that right? Okay. Now, this right here is the four, foremost forward cylinder on the crankshaft. See, this right here, this is cylinder number one. It's the farthest one forward on the crankshaft. The one behind it is cylinder number two, and it's going the other way. You know, of course, like I say, on these, they go back and forth. On the Ford, uh, the forward one on the crankshaft is the one on the other bank. And they counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the reason that, you know, they number those that way. Um, but interestingly enough, number eight on this one and on the Ford are in the same spot. You notice that? Anyway, I'm going to go over there. Now, that is 3 liter Taurus Adventure. This is a compression related thing. Starts hard, fuel fouls the plug. If you can keep it running past cold engine, it would smoke a little bit sitting there idling, and it ran okay then. I didn't see anything going on with the oxygen sensors or nothing. Uh, but uh, driving the car, it ran like a show Taurus. I mean, this thing would just get right out from under you, and it had pinged just a little bit on hard acceleration. Uh, but whenever you let it cool down again, it was really hard to start. You had to feather the throttle to keep it alive. Compression check was, showed 210 PSI across the board. Usually a 3 liter engine like this would have 160 per cylinder when it was a new engine. Initially the shop foreman acted like he didn't think that was a big deal. I said, no, you get, you're not going to tell me. I got this much more compression. I got 50 pounds more compression on every cylinder than I usually have on a Taurus. Turned out the doggone Whoever had rented the car, and it was a rental car with 1,800 miles on it, somebody had filled it up with diesel fuel before they took it back. You know, and I don't know how much diesel, what the mix was, uh, but when I got gasoline on my hand and I took a fuel sample and waved it around in front of me until the fuel dried off, you could smell diesel fuel on your hand. And furthermore, I hooked the injector cleaning machine up to it and, you know, isolated the rest of the fuel supply from it. And it would run really good on normal gasoline, but it wouldn't, you know, it, it did loud. So we had to drain the tank and put, you know, good clean gas in there and all that. Anyway, it was doing a perpetual wet test, so that greasy diesel was sealing those rings and making it have more compression, making it smoke a little bit at idle and all that. Well, about three or four days later, there's this guy that was down the line there. He said, hey, I got this thing. It's, you know, he described exactly the same symptoms I had. I said, see if it's got diesel in the gasoline. And he said, yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> he fixed one like that. But anyway, all right, that's the end of the story. We've been here 18 minutes. Maybe you had time to make it to the end. And I'm going to really enjoy hearing from you guys, hopefully. Share this video with friends and tell me what you think of it. See if you got anything out of this at all. And I'll see you guys next week.